Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Mission Control. This is a podcast that focuses on executive directors and how they strive to make positive impacts in their community. I'm your host, Paul Schmidt, owner and creative video strategist for Introduce Multimedia. And I would like to welcome my guest for this time around, Tanisha Ashakur from Voices of Color. How are you doing, Tanisha? Thank you for being on my and wonderful. How are you? <laughs> oh, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. Just to, you know, have the ability to slow you down for a second to have like a little bit of a conversation. I so appreciate you slowing me down because I literally just ran in the house <laughs> from a press conference. So I, yeah, I'm appreciating a moment to sit and talk to you. <laughs> awesome. Well, let's just dive right in. The first thing that I do when we start each one of these programs is learn about the mission of your organization. So what's the mission? Okay, so the mission of Voices of Color is to educate and prevent domestic violence for all ages, races, sexual orientations, religions, and genders, and then actively, to I'm sorry, actively work towards restoring self-empowerment for victims and survivors. Mm, well, it's uh, especially needed in this day and time, yes. absolutely. But before we dive into the nuts and bolts, I've got to ask this. I came across this while I was researching the program, and I want you I want to get your take on it. Okay. Talk to me about Tenacious Tanisha. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I'm going to go. I'm diving right in. Diving right in. Okay. So actually, Tenacious Tanisha came about. I was actually working a job after I came out of law school. And I've always been very assertive and um, I've never had to at any job really wait on someone to tell me what my next task was. Um, I'm always one that if I can't figure it out, I really will work to figure it out before I go and ask a question because I'm like challenging myself. And so one of my supervisors, she was like, you're so tenacious. And so they kind of went with the tease and I was like, OK, so that's how tenacious Tanisha came about. Um, was based on my work ethics. And so um, it, it has kind of stuck with me. And now I use it because I'm like, you know what? That works. That works for me. Yeah. Well, you know, talking with you and learning more about what you do in life, and I can see how that word really applies. And so also with your your choice in profession, starting off law, why, why, why law? Um, I think for me, so I grew up and I was one of those uh, kids that always watched like all these legal shows with my mom. And so at first I kind of thought, oh, I want to be, you know, like a forensics person to be on the crime. Um, and then I realized, you know what? I have a mouthpiece on me. <laughs> so I say, I think I want to be like the raw, raw person in the courtroom. I love the idea of fierce women in the courtroom and really advocating for people and being a voice for them. And so I decided being an attorney was what uh, I wanted to do. Um, I wasn't sure what type of law that I wanted to practice. Um, and so it sort of unfolded. It was kind of like trial and error going in to figure out what I would be focusing on. Um, but so, yeah, that's how it sort of came about. I started really diving into my personality and getting to know who I was and so and who I am and yeah I thought that that was pretty good for me <laughs> <laughs> oh, but but looking at um you know you know going through all the the things that you went through after law school and where you were finding yourself involved seemed to be and we'll obviously this mm -hmm. is a definite segue people in the audience, if you follow this path, um, <laughs> into like the advocacy and criminal justice work. So talk to me about your transition over to that and really diving into that. So are you referencing my transition from uh, like me going through like, yeah, you, you know, when you the world. So yeah. um, obviously prior to me moving to Michigan, um, I had been in a very abusive relationship 
with someone I had met in undergrad, known about three or four years. Um, and once we got into a relationship, it became very abusive until I was being raped by my abuser. Um, I was eventually able to get out, not on my own accord. I, I want to make that very clear, not on my own accord with the help of family. Um, and as I went into law school, I, I, I thought I was healed because of this idea that if you can just move on with life, you know, you just shut everything out and you just dive into life. Um, and I really thought that I was okay. And as I started going through law school, I took a course. It was actually called Battered, like it was called Battered Women. And I'm listening to these future attorneys. And I said, oh my God, I want to be like, my colleagues are complete idiots. And I realized that these future attorneys, they literally have no knowledge about domestic violence. And it's something that we often think people kind of have an ideal about, but they don't. And Judge Aquilina was my professor at the time. Mm -hmm. And she allowed me to share my story in class. Um, and so that was my very first time speaking about it. Um, and I was emotional in class. And it sort of sparked something where people wanted to know more because my image was very strong. And so people couldn't fathom, like, not you. And so I began to realize there's this theory or concept or bias about what victims look like, what survivors look like. And I wanted to educate more. So I started speaking out and telling my story wherever and whenever I could. Um, and it was after I graduated from law school, I was like, you know what? I'm gonna start a nonprofit. Had no idea that that, was, that would be my avenue. Um, and I did, and that's, I started a nonprofit, Voices of Color, obviously, and I was like, you know what? I'm just going to dive in. I knew what I didn't have as a victim or survivor, what, how I felt there were injustices and things that didn't work out for me. And I wanted to fill those gaps. And then so I began to talk to other organizations and agencies, the local shelters and said, what are the gaps? What? Because I don't need to duplicate services, right? I need to fill in the gaps. And so that's what we've been doing ever since. Mm. So going through the, you know, going through law school and having to do this presentation um, that was asked of you, had you, uh, was this a therapeutic moment? Had you gone through any type of therapy prior or was this, was it like you said, a complete light bulb moment? I would say it was a complete light bulb moment. And the reason I say that is because I had gone through therapy uh, right after coming out in 2008, but this is now 2012 when mm -hmm. I went to law school. And even though I had gone through therapy, I was mute. I always say like for about a year after coming out of my abuse relationship, I didn't talk. Um, I had nothing to say and I couldn't articulate. And I always say I wasn't emotionally intelligent. And so I say that because I was not able to articulate anything that had happened. I couldn't explain it. I couldn't really tell you what my emotions was. I was having crying spells and I couldn't tell you why I would randomly be crying. Um, so I had all, these array of emotions just happening in my life. Um, and what I also learned was people tell you to get therapy but you need a specialized therapy. You need trauma-informed therapy. And so what was happening, even though I was going to therapists, they were giving me the feel-good messages, right? And so I could say I'm suicidal and someone would say, oh, but look at how successful you've been in life. And I'm like, that doesn't help me. So mm -hmm. when I had that opportunity in law school, to talk, it was really, I, it just hit me because I, I hadn't shared it, but it hit me because it was like so many people were talking and I, and it, I just realized like people are talking, they don't realize the effect that their words and thoughts may have on individuals around them because they don't, they haven't even thought about somebody around them just because we're in law school that we may be very well be a victim, excuse me, survivor ourselves. And 
it all just gave me a moment to to realize that how people come from, from various different backgrounds um, or they haven't been exposed to certain things in life and they move into their careers with just that. And so in that aha moment, it was just like, I can't, I just, I can't allow them to think that this is just what it is. Like we choose to be beat. We choose to undergo like the trauma, like nobody just signs up for that, you know? Mm. So with this, so with your uh, nonprofit, do you offer that type of listening? Yes. Listening? Okay. Um, so I, I will tell you that a lot of times um, I do get calls, emails, texts where people are, they're just seeking confirmation of what they're going through. They may not want, say, a label on it yet, but they want to tell me this is what happened. Um, and I can, you know, say that's not okay. And what we do is we continue until I always say my favorite saying, and I love to tell people this, is I don't tell people they need to get out of their relationship. One, they already know that. And two, when leaving an abuser, it increases, the homicide rate increases 75%. And that's huge. So what happens is I continue those conversations with them when and say, when you're ready, I'm ready. So when you're ready to say you need to get out, we'll be here to help you. And in that meantime, I'm gathering a lot of information about their environment, how to safely get them out and learning so much details. But a lot I've spent months just they I say, call me when you need a, when you need to talk. Call me when something happens and you just want to say this just happened. I'm being manipulated gaslighting is happening and I'm second guessing myself and they just need me to confirm and affirm them. And sometimes that's just the service we'll provide. So let me ask you, how come you decided to go the law route instead of like a therapist route? Cause it sounds like, <laughs> it sounds like you're a pretty darn good therapist. So Actually, I, I was funny. I was just talking to my husband about this, and I said I want to go back and get a psychology degree <laughs> because I would like I want to combine all of it together, right? Um, but I do also know that having that legal background gives me the authority to walk into spaces that some people just can't because of how our world is just set up. I also know it gives me an opportunity to affect legislation in a different way, which people every day, the everyday person can also. And so we're fighting different bills and trying to bring different bills for it that ultimately work for victims and survivors as well. So the legal route has just gave me insight into um, being able to really advocate in a court setting um, because oftentimes you don't understand the legal jargon um, and you can easily be manipulated when you see paperwork, when someone begins to tell you something, you're like, what are they talking about? And that is oftentimes how victims and survivors, especially when they have children, they have no idea and they end up losing their children. Um, they, you know, PPOs are not granted for them because they didn't understand the legal jury. So now having that background, it gives me the opportunity to break those things down because I can understand them. Yeah, that does make a whole lot of sense. I, I really, I, I kind of figured that's where you were going to go, but I just wanted to know. I was like, yeah, because you, know, <laughs> you were telling people to call, you know, yeah, that's, that's, that's incredible. So yeah. let me tell you, or let me ask you this. Um, how hard is it to do both be a lawyer and be a nonprofit uh, founder, uh, you know, executive director, how, how difficult is it to, I mean, I know that they kind of intertwine, but you know, I'm just thinking about your law work and then you're trying to make sure that this nonprofit stays afloat. Those are two full-time jobs. Yeah. <laughs> um, let's just say 
that um, I am like two people for 24 hours. <laughs> um, I have had three computers at my desk where over here I'm working on, you know, court hearings. Over here I might have something up for my voices of color. So I, it's not, it's, it can be a 24 hour job because I know be, like before is you have your job that's paying. I've never paid myself for a day for my nonprofit. Um, and at the same time, I'm praying that I can just eventually just do my nonprofit. And that's kind of where I am now. I've officially stopped working my full-time job so that I can kind of focus on really pushing my nonprofit to be all of it, all that it needs to be. Um, and so it is, it's a lot, Paul. I, I, it's, it's a lot. My health has suffered. Um, and I would not encourage anybody to do what I'm doing and what I have done is not healthy. Um, and I think that, um, sometimes we feel we're built to test a lot of different things. And the honest truth is we we're not. Um, and something has to give. And oftentimes my health has been what suffered at the hands of trying to do so much. Well, as a poster child of letting your health run you, I completely <laughs> can relate to that. And that's yep. kind of like why I brought it up a little bit, because the simple fact is it's not that you're not trying to do good. Um, and it's not like you're not trying to be, uh, you know, splintered um yeah. it's just a matter of these are way way your ways your worlds have collided at this point um yeah. but diving into the nonprofit work um what all do you offer i mean what is all that voices of color does so right now so we offer a plethora of services so essentially i want to first say even if someone comes to us and they need a service that we typically don't provide we will essentially provide it. But on average, we work, we are advocates. So we uh, do court accompaniment, meaning anytime they have hearings, whether it's in person or via Zoom, we will attend with them. We also work with completing and filing personal protection orders. Um, we also will file, excuse me, we also will pay for the process servicing, which can be costly at times. Um, so we will have those served for them and then the process servicer will file it with the clerk once it's filed. We've provided relocation, uh, emergency shel sheltering, uh, hotel stays, and we uh, work a lot in tandem with the local shelters and shelters throughout the state to provide that emergency sheltering. Um, we also refer for therapy. So I have connections within the community where I will send them for trauma-informed therapy. And again, what that, we also have had to provide like deposits. So a lot of times there becomes a problem once they, uh, many may not want to go to a shelter. Shelters, one, are not always a pleasant place to live. We know that. Um, sometimes people are coming from a, a beautiful home that just it has domestic violence involved and their home looks a lot better than a shelter does. And so they don't want to live in a shelter. And so they may be seeking to go directly into their own living arrangements. And so they just don't have the deposit or um, first month's rent. So we will assist them with that. We've assisted with also if they have to put um, their items in storage, we can pay for storage and also any debt. We have help with debts. Depending on what the debt is, typically it may involve they weren't able to pay a storage fee or they're behind in rent. Um, it can be something of that nature. And also with gas. Um, so that I would say that's sort of the array. Most of our, what we've been really busy with now is of course the uh, emergency sheltering, but court hearings. So we have court hearings specifically related to maybe their case. And then we have family court referee hearings. And then we also have CPS hearings. One of the services that I've started working in now is expert witness testimony. So what that looks like is um, if they are in, say, having a CPS hearing or referee hearing or just a criminal case, 
I can go in now as an expert witness and testify to domestic violence in their cases. And that's a huge benefit because a lot of times you believe it or not, a lot of times attorneys don't want to work with advocates. Mm -hmm. um, you would think they do, but they don't. Mm -hmm. And so we're able to go in court now and provide expert witness testimony. Wow. That's a lot of stuff that you're able to offer. Yeah. And, um, so with all that, um, how are you able to discern who does what, or is it just still on you? It's still on me. If I am fortunate to have dedicated volunteers, uh, obviously volunteers have to be trained, but I will tell you that it's hard because What's different about my organization than a lot of other nonprofits doing the work is we're boots on the ground. So whereas victims and survivors may report to a shelter and everything is situated there, I'm meeting people in the community where they are. So that might be Starbucks, that might be the mall, whatever is convenient and works for them to safely be able to move to that next step. We may have to do a trans action to get them relocated at Applebee's or wherever's convenient. And that everybody's not prepared for that. Um, and I think where people feel that this is where their heart is when they get into the nitty gritty, it is mentally exhausting. Um, and if I could think people realize they're not as passionate about it more so than they think, Oh, this is amazing work. Right. And, um, so a lot of times it does follow me. And I also, there, and I, I will tell you too, Paul, there's a part where this is my baby, right? <laughs> and <laughs> I, I don't, I always want the people we serve to feel that we are going to be there for them. And to there, there's verbiage that you have to learn when you're dealing with victims and survivors. So it's a lot of training to go through and it's, it's something you have to learn all the time, but sometimes you don't have people to stick with you long enough to go through that process or you realize like, oh my God, yeah, I can't have them work for me. You know, so I'm I'm a little cautious too, I guess you would say. No, I understand. I mean, you, you I mean, there's a lot of sensitive situations yeah. that you have to uh be in that you have to work with your clients through um and so and speaking of which sensitivities were at an all-time high yes. over the past three years starting i shouldn't say starting but exacerbated yes by the pandemic how did all of that fold into how 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 your world was over the, the and that's probably yeah. attributed that's all was probably attributable to your health as well. Yes. So anyway, all that to say, yeah. how did COVID mess you up? Uh, I, it was like a supply and demand issue, right? Because we had a, a high need and not the capacity. And that was throughout with several DV agencies. Everybody had this overload. Um, because what people, you know, even for the state of Michigan, you know, it was stay home, stay safe. But that wasn't the case for our world. Staying home wasn't safe for them. And all of these things that we knew, how to keep someone safe, how to safety plan, safety plans that were in place were no longer effective. You know, you may have set up a safety plan where someone was at work, you know, they go to work every day. Now, no one's going to work. So that's out the, and now you're trying to figure out how to get there, how to meet with them, because if both of them are home, the abuser and the victim are both home now from work. So it, it just changed our world of having to be really creative, um, using technology more, um, probably um, just because they were either have to communicate. And just like with my website, once it comes up, they're able to click to exit my website and go, it will go to like the local weather. Um, so just, you know, coming up with every possible strategy, a lot of times 
Uh, we would just text back and forth. And I may ask, do you have to work today? Or, you know, something very simple so it didn't appear. And if the way they responded, it would allow me to know they were okay or not. Um, we had problems with even when we were trying to get someone now, um, you know, they may have lost their homes. So they were living in hotels, but the perpetrator was at the hotel too. Now we have the red tape because we have to go through the hotel. You can't just go in and take over a space. You're scared with law enforcement. We were doing wellness checks and we tell law enforcement, hey, I don't want you to go up and actually say you're here to do a wellness check because then that lets him know um, that she said something to someone. Somebody's worried about her for a reason. And they will go to the door and say, hey, we're here to do a wellness check. And I'm like, um, and so those numbers were rising. Um, and especially for the shelters, they weren't, they didn't know what to do. How do, if someone comes to the shelter, do we take them if they have COVID? Do we turn them away? Because if you turn them away, they're going back to their abuser. So they had to figure that out. And so we created uh, a monthly call where we just sit and brainstorm. What issues are you having at your agency? What things are you seeing? Do I have extra masks that I can send to the shelter for you? So that's kind of how we began to work to figure out what problems and issues were happening um, and how best to solve some of those problems. So there were in gaps in serving our population. Yeah, it, it was, uh, I can only imagine. I mean, yeah. and, and you are, you're working in two different worlds. So I know that we've stressed enough about the fact that you don't sleep. <laughs> However, there's still, I don't know how you do it, but there's still more time in the day that you seem to find. So talk to me a little bit about the family. Okay. How do you, how do you, uh, what do you do or how do you escape? How do you decompress and, and, uh, talk, you know, give some well, shout outs to your wonderful family. Yeah. So my husband is the great Reverend Dr. Akil Ashakor. <laughs> um, I have three beautiful children who are all grown. We are empty nesters now. Finally. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, Jabril Ashakor is my oldest. He lives in Charlotte, North Carolina. My daughter is Jayla Ashakor. She's 23. She's in Charlotte, North Carolina now. So my baby girl, I was a little hurt when she left Michigan to go to North Carolina, but we're from North Carolina. So oh. she's safe there with family. And then my son, the youngest is 18. He is at the University of Oregon. Mm. Um, excelling, doing very well. So um, as you know, my husband is an actor, so he's always busy and trying to support me whenever and however, and I'm trying to support him. So all the time, you know, he may be going out of town, uh, to film. And, uh, so I also try to keep him balanced while he's trying to keep me balanced. And so we, I would say we have a great partnership in that way. Um, holding each other accountable to make space and to make time. Um, and for the children, they have started creating their own businesses. Uh, my youngest son, he's uh, he's going to school for accounting and he has a 4.0 GPA. He's on the dean's list. My daughter has started her own business in photography, um, but she's in finance with baking. And my son, he studied kinesiology. And now he actually has his own podcast and is a huge YouTuber. And on Instagram, he's received like this huge plaque now for all these millions of followers he has. Um, and one, he's a very smart businessman because I always say he thinks like my husband. He uh, started a hair care line. And I remember being like, I sent you to college to start a hair care line. But it was strategy. He, uh, in training, most of his, you know, the people he trained were women who always complained about their hair. So he came out with a hair care line and it has blossomed and is working, going amazingly. So um, I would say we are a very blessed family who have a store. We all have a story. 
Um, as you know, um, I'm married into children. And so um, we have just been blessed and we we bond and they are my babies. Um, and we love hard because we know if not us, no one else. And um, we constantly are pushing one another to be who we are meant to be and purpose to be, um, encouraging each other in that way. And so when people see our children, you know, they were like, y'all did something right. Y'all did something right. And I'm like, you know, that's that's how it should be. Everybody should be a reflection. And we've always said that we we've we used to have um, uh, uh, family meetings and just allow space for communication, um, even the tough conversations. And we will remind each other we are our brand. And that's the Asha Core brand. So remember, no matter how grown you get, no matter what world you're in, <laughs> we all represent one another. So if you go out here and do something crazy, it's a reflection of me. And the same thing, if I do something crazy, it's a reflection for you all. And so we stand on we are our brand. That's awesome. And I know that we could talk forever, but <laughs> we have to come to a close. But in the meantime, how do people get a hold of you to learn more about what Voices of Color is doing? So you can directly text me. I'm all my sale, my business sale is always accessible. That number is 252-955-8902. I'm also on social media. Um, is Facebook.com is at the voices of color. Also the same on Instagram. Yeah, so follow us on social media. And you can also email me at the voices of color at gmail.com. But if you text me, you I can give you all the information as well. Awesome. Thank you again, Tanisha, for spending a little bit of time and diving into your story. Like you said, we all have stories and the year yours was great. So thank and, you so much, Paul. I really appreciate you. Oh, thank you. And thank you in the audience for taking some more time to listen to our program. Don't miss the next episode that's coming out in a couple weeks. And if there is somebody you know of that you would like to hear more about their journey and their story, please email us at missioncontrolintroduce.com. And if this is your first time here, please subscribe on YouTube or your favorite podcasting platform and give us a positive review. Thank you all again and see you next time in the Control Center.